1619 project began as a work of journalism. Still is. It still is. But you, did you have grander plans? It was published in August uh, 2019. But did you have grander plans from the beginning? Did you see what it could become? Hell no. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I had no idea. I mean, the, the original project was a grand plan. Yeah. Um, Never in the history of the Times has a single issue of the magazine, a special section, and a podcast series been dedicated to one thing. Um, so even just pitching that was extremely ambitious, and it also then came with a great risk. Uh, I talk a lot about how, you know, in the week before publication, I was like sick. I couldn't sleep. I was worried um, because I had commanded all of these resources from the Times as a black woman uh, on a project about slavery. Uh, and if no one read it, if no one cared, you know this, you've yeah, been absolutely. in the industry a long time, it closes the door. So we bear responsibility. If a white journalist uh, pitches something ambitious and it doesn't work out, that reflects on that journalist. But if a black journalist pitches something ambitious and it doesn't reflect out, uh, doesn't, doesn't work out, it reflects on all of us. Um, and so I, I didn't know. I knew, I knew it would produce something powerful. Like you could, the day we laid, um, printed out the entire magazine and, and put it up on the wall in the, in the room so that we could see it in its entirety. Um, you know, Wesley Morris and I, who wrote the music essay, he was, he was at work that day and I called him in and we just embraced each other and started sobbing. Um, because one, we couldn't believe, you know, we had produced this at the New York Times. Um, it was painful to do, but we also saw its power. Yeah. But you can produce something powerful and people still won't care. So I, no, I, I had no idea it would become what it will become. So we take the project to book form. Uh, yes. There's seven new essays, more than a thousand end notes, <laughs> a list, a long list, very impressive list of peer reviewers. Yes. Um, what was revised, what was enhanced, and, and how did you go about constructing the book? So the beauty of um, the book is having faced two years of scrutiny, two years of critique, some of it, much of it bad faith, but some of it good critique, legitimate critique. Um, we were able to use that to really strengthen, perfect um, the project and show our work. So every essay, if you read the original project, Every single essay has been expanded significantly. Um, and then we have new essays that go into different areas that we weren't able to talk about in the original project. So for instance, we didn't deal with um, settler colonialism or Indian removal in the original project, which I always knew was a gaping hole. You can't talk about slavery um, without talking about the first people who were enslaved by the colonists, which were indigenous people. And then the fact that you can't expand slavery unless you steal the land. So that was necessary. We have an amazing piece, which I actually think of all the pieces in the book will probably be most surprising to kind of your more casual um, reader. Um, because it also talks about the five so-called civilized tribes who engaged in chattel slavery, which we also don't learn about. Um, that uh, there were black folks on the Trail of Tears, but they were enslaved. We don't talk about that. So there's an essay about that. Um, we have an essay that uh, talks about the Haitian Revolution and how it impacts the United States as well. The first project, I was very intentional that we weren't dealing with the diaspora. Like, I always feel like black Americans are asked to like, hold the weight of the entire black diaspora and we can never just have our own story. And this was a story about us. But having done that, now in the book form, we were able to expand it out. Um, the poetry, and fiction, which doesn't get talked en about enough, which is why we've been having these amazing um, writers, some of the greatest American writers uh, living, um, do readings at all of these events because it's such a powerful part of it. Uh, it's organized as a literary timeline. Um, so the first poem is Claudia Rankin in 1619. The last is uh, Mama Sonia Sanchez, who's 87 years old and still out here fighting for us um, about George Floyd and everywhere in between, and they are just beautiful and powerful and remarkable on their own. Um, and then, you know, one thing about me is I do care deeply about the work, 
the research, my credibility as a journalist. So I, um, when all of these people were trying to attack the project, and especially that you know, couple paragraphs about the American Revolution, I was like, okay, you don't know me. Because I would just read more and study more and sharpen. And uh, now that section, which was a couple paragraphs, is like several pages long with lots of end notes. Uh, and I don't back off of it at all. So if you had questions about it, and what it did was it allowed me to get my vengeance through research. <laughs> um, Joan, read the passage that, that you just referenced about the American Revolution. You know, that, and, and, and one of the things you said as you were, as I heard you talk about it, is, is the notion that history itself is, you know, a profession of consensus, but it's not settled argument. That's right. You know, that, that history evolves and we have debate within the profession of historians, right? Yes. And, but here's a passage, and I watched all this debate. I'm just going to read it and then want to, want to hear how you addressed it. Um, this is what got some of the historians in a lather, right? Um, <laughs> One critical reason that the colonists declared their independence from Britain was because they wanted to protect the institution of slavery in the colonies, which had produced tremendous wealth. At the time, there were growing calls to abolish slavery throughout the British Empire, which would have badly damaged the economies of colonies in both North and South. And that's what some people said was not accurate. Your, your response to that with all your research is what? Um, so, my flip response is, then I get into my real response, is it, no one can believe that I just sat down one day and said, you know, I'm doing this major project in the New York Times and I'm just going to make some shit up, right? right? <laughs> right. Defies logic. Right. <laughs> so, history as we think about it is this happened on this date, and this is why. But history is actually what we're told about what happened on what date. And it's also how we interpret what happens on what date. So if I am a white man for all of American history from 1770s until 50 years ago, I'm writing about Thomas Jefferson and I'm not talking about slavery. But that doesn't mean slavery didn't matter. It just means I'm not talking about it. Black people, of course, have always told that history from the bottom and have almost always been out of the consensus. When Annette Gordon-Reed does her landmark book on Sally Hemings, the Hemingses, mm -hmm. and argues, of course, that Thomas Jefferson had uh, sexual relations with a teenager and produced children by her, the consensus was that that shit was not true. <laughs> they castigated her for that scholarship. Yeah, I remember. And now, even Monticello, his estate acknowledges that he had these children. So this is what we're seeing. There, there, are, there are historians who have long argued about the role of slavery in the revolution. They have not been the center. And what is interesting is these historians who pretend that historiography is an objective field have shown that it's not, because even they need to believe in our founding as divine and American exceptionalism. And so if you talk about slavery, um, then you realize that we were exceptional in a really shitty way. Yeah. <laughs> Matthew Desmond on capitalism. Mm -hmm. America. Those are the two essays that really made people mad: <laughs> democracy and capitalism. Yeah, yeah. That's an irony. Well, because those are right. Those are the pillars of of our ideas of American exceptionalism: that we're the freest nation in the history of the world if you just ignore black people and everybody else who wasn't white. <laughs> and the capitalism is the greatest and freest economic system in the world. So to argue that um, our system, our free economic system was built on forced slave labor um, kind of messes up their, their little story. They don't like that. They don't like those two essays. Matthew Desmond wrote, America has evolved into one of the world's most unequitable societies. Today, the richest 10% of Americans own over 75% of the country's wealth. 
with the top 1% owning well over a third. Many of the political systems, legal arrangements, cultural beliefs, and economic structures that uphold and promote this level of inequality trace their roots back to slavery and its aftermath. He's not arguing that capitalism in and of itself is necessarily bad. I mean, most of the European democracies, I think all of them are capitalist countries, but they don't have the type of capitalism, capitalism that we practice here. And the problem here is when you have a system of capitalism that's built on the premise that you can do anything to someone for profit, anything, including buy and sell them and torture them, that there's no floor to that capitalism. And that's what we have. You know, we, we are an exceptional nation in all the ways that we shouldn't be. We have the most income inequality of any of the Western democracies. We're the only one of those countries where uh, people die because they can't afford to go to the doctor. We're the only one where a woman gives birth and has to return to work within a couple of weeks because she's not going to get a paycheck. Um, all of these, these things come from a society that was rooted in the idea that you could do anything to extract profit. And we accept it because we don't know that it doesn't have to be this way. Um, but it doesn't. And um, I mean, What's, I think, so amazing about that essay is the way it shows, like, so many of the practices that we accept, the surveillance at work, like, at a place like Amazon, um, those practices were perfected on the plantation. We are taught to think of uh, plantation slavery as kind of pre-modern, as backwards, as somehow unprofitable, even though all of the European countries engaged in slavery and the wealthiest colonies were all slave colonies. We've been told somehow that it's not profitable. Um, that takes an intense amount of surveillance to be able to force people to work for free. The accounting systems, like, I went to, you know, we're working on the 1619 documentary, I went to Baton Rouge at, um, at the university there and looked at the ledgers. I mean, they're tracking cotton production for each enslaved person hour by hour. Do you know how much work that takes? And then at the end of the day, they're saying, okay, well, yesterday you picked this much. Right. So, and then enslaved people are having to make these constant calculations because if I don't pick enough, I'm gonna get beaten. But if I pick too much, they're gonna expect me to pick this much every day. And then you're seeing on that same ledger a human child being listed as $70 and a cow being listed as 1000 mm -hmm. all on the same ledger. Um, so this, this belief that, you know, workers shouldn't have certain rights or certain protections and that uh, we're all in this on our own because um, you just have to pay people the least possible so you can make the most money, that we didn't invent capitalism in America, but our uh, ca form of capitalism uh, was, was built in a completely immoral and corrupt system. You know, it's a tremendous achievement that you had, you, and you've had so many so you, you worked hard and you have the success and I know you don't want to rest, but what, what are your dreams these days and what else do you want to accomplish? Mm. I'm done now, I'm about to retire. <laughs> just playing, just playing, just playing. No, no, no. Um, you know, <laughs> my dream is that, um, I, I think it's in the last essay of the book, which is that we um, acknowledge what we have done in this country. We, atone for it, and then we repair. And repair has to include financial reparations for the descendants of slavery. Um, and Dr. King says, you know, the Dr. King that goes past 1963 and that one line in the speech, we only ever talk about that one line, because um, the rest of the speech, of course, he talks about there, that was a march on Washington for jobs and freedom. Understanding that freedom is tied to your economic status. And he says, we're coming here to cash a check that has been returned and marked insufficient funds. And if you look at King, the 1967 King, 1968 King, before they assassinated him, where all the civil rights laws except for the Fair Housing Act have been passed. And he said that was the easy work. He said the real struggle is going to be when we start talking about economic redistribution. And this is where we will lose our white allies. And he did. So. It's not enough to just hope things will get better. Hope is an action. And I will hope that my legacy 
is that I will work in the tradition of so many black activists and so many organizations right now that are trying to repair the financial harm that a 350-year-old racialized system of economic exploitation um, has wrought. Nicole Hannah-Jones. That's that. Thank you for being here.